The project district heating for the future is initiated by Dean Forsyning Varme to establish new heat production. Up until recently, Dean Forsyning was buying all the heat from two main suppliers. One is the waste to energy plant and the other one is the coal-fired power station. Ørsted, the owner of the coal-fired power station, decided to shut down the plant and Dean Forsyning was looking at different alternatives and ended up deciding to build a new heat producing facility to supply approximately half the heat needed for our consumers. The other half being supplied by the waste to energy plant. When we looked into this, we were considering different options and ended up in a system that should be robust in the way that we could use different uh, sources of heat production. So the two main sources is the wood chip boiler, um, which is approximately 60 megawatt, and the heat pump in the building here, which is approximately 70 megawatt. This gives us about 110 megawatt. In addition to that, we have an electrical fire boiler, which is 40 megawatt, giving us a total production capacity down here, approximately 150 megawatt. It is not sufficient. On the coldest day, we are up to 400 megawatt, and we therefore also have some peak boilers, uh, natural gas and bio oil, which is our existing uh, reserve boilers that we integrate in the system. Let's take a closer look to the different units. We have the pumping house, Accumulator, heat pump on the back here, the transformer, the wood boiler building, and the wood chip reception system. The wood chip will arrive to the plant on trucks and will drive over the, uh, the way bridge, which is behind us, come over this open area and into one of the two gates. There will be traffic lights giving admittance. It will drive into the building and back tip into the, um, the conveyor, which is uh, submerged under the floor here. Gates will close in both ends of the building when the trucks are offloaded so that we can suck all dusts and uh, smelly substances from the wood chip during offloading. Also, if there are any fungus in the material, it cannot enter the surroundings. At the tipping area, there are two ventilations, uh, a ventilation intake, so we'll suck all the air away. So it's safe for the driver and so on to, to stay in the building. Once the, uh, the wood chip has been offloaded, it goes to the screening building, which you can see behind. On the transport up to the screening building, we have a a, a, a Röntgen measurements where we actually x-ray the, uh, the wood chip. We can see the content of water, we can see foreign objects and we can also see the size distribution of the wood chip. So we can make a quality check immediately on reception whether it's according to the contractual specifications or not. And we can also measure the water content which is the basis of the price of the wood chip. So we will know immediately what to pay the supplier for the wood chip upon reception. In the screening building, we will screen off, uh, take uh, ferretic metal away, uh, balls, whatever, that has ended up into the wood chip that we do not want into the boiler. And we will also take oversized material. But in case that a supplier has provided us with something which we will not use at all, we can also throw it out of the building and uh, we can have the supplier come and pick it up later. After it has gone through the screening building or quality control building, if you put it that way, the wood chip will go to our main storage. And uh, we have about 8,000 cubic meters inside the silo here, which is approximately four days of full load operation on the boiler. The reason for four days is that we would like to have our operators to be able to go home for Christmas or have a long weekend. The plant is designed to be unmanned, meaning that there will only be operational staff and maintenance staff here during normal business hours. So weekends, holidays, whatever, it's not planned for anybody to be here. It will run automatically. That's the reason for the size. And the wood chip goes by a rubber band conveyor up into the boiler hall, where it's distributed to the day silos of the boiler. The 
wood chip boiler has a combined output of 60 megawatt. 40 megawatt comes from the pressure part you see behind and another 15 megawatt approximately comes from the flue gas compensation. Between, in between the boiler and the flue gas condensation there will be a back filter. It's not here now but it will be erected shortly. So when we burn the wood chip the flue gas is passed through a fabric filter where we take out the dust. After the fabric filter the flue gases pass into an SCR where we will take the, the NOx out or the uh, ammonium, uh, the nitrogen oxides out of the, the flue gas. Uh, passing through a, another heating surface external economizer as we call it, cooling the flue gas down to around 160 degrees where we will quench it with additional water going into the flue gas condensation. And as we run the flue gas condensation we will produce water and the water we will actually clean to use that as make-up water for our district heating system. So we are not using other water resources when the, the boiler here is in operation for supplying the water, the makeup water for our systems. As you make the, uh, as we make the makeup water, um, we will clean the condensate. The, the condensate will have a high concentration of salts, whatever, which will actually be re-injected in the boiler. So. The, the salts are collected in the, uh, the dust from the filter again. So we have a sort of integrated system where we are, are you can say, taking condensate out, but also the residues from the, the condensate cleaning is put back into the boiler ends up in this system. And we take the rest of the heat out in the flue gas condensation. On the normal operation, we will enter the chimney with around 50 degrees. But if we choose to cool uh, the, the district heating water further down with our heat pump. We can couple the two systems and we can actually go down as low as around 10 degrees in the chimney, which means that the overall thermal efficiency of the boiler exceeds 120% based on the lower heating value. So it's a, it's a good system, but it's also an integrated system. As the boiler runs, it will heat up the district heating water, which goes in series First step in series is the heat pump, second step in the series is the, uh, the boiler here itself. And so, you can say they help each other. The more the, 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 the wood chip boiler runs, the more, the lower the temperature out of the, the, the district, the, or the, the heat pump is. And with the lower heat temperature out of the heat pump, the higher the COP, the higher the efficiency. So the, the plants will actually work in synergy. So when they're, they both are operating, they will increase the efficiency on both systems. The heat pump is one of our two main heat producing units. The heat pump is based on seawater. We have a seawater intake in the harbor. The seawater is pumped up here and in the long evaporators here we extract the heat and return it to, uh, to the Vatten Sea. We cool the water about 3 degrees. The heat pump consists of two units identically built. The units are with a heat capacity about 35 megawatts each um, and they have, are based on the refrigerant CO2. Uh, the CO2 boils in the evaporator at a pressure about 30, 35 bar. It's taken to the compressor, which you can see behind us, and will, which will compress the CO2 gas up to about 120 bar. That is above the, the critical point, so we are running a supercritical refrigerant circle here. The uh, refrigerant goes into the uh, heat exchanger for the district heating system. It is not installed yet, but what is installed is our district heating pipes, which are on the wall here. Um, and from there, when having passed through the, the heat exchanger, the CO2, which is again still super critical, so it has passed, it's still a fluid, however a little bit higher density, will actually go back to the other end of the compressor where there is an expander, which will expand our small turbine which will extract the, the energy which is in the pressure down to 33 bars again. 
We have chosen to use CO2 as a refrigerant because it's environmentally friendly. We have been looking at different solutions, but in our final decision, we ended up uh, choosing CO2 above ammonia, above uh, synthetic uh, refrigerants. The reason for that is that the thermodynamic performance is just as good as the other refrigerants. Um, the performance here, especially on the compressor, is outstanding when it comes to the, uh, the capabilities of providing grid regulating services. And there's a lot of environmental benefits. If CO2 leaks into the system, out into the seawater, it's completely harmless. It will not harm the marine life or anything else. Whereas other refrigerants are either poisonous or will never degenerate. The CO2 will basically just enter the normal CO2 cycle of the sea. So we have here a very, very green and very environmentally safe solution. We are here actually, this is our, our visitor's room and uh, on the normal circumstances the only people who will actually enter into the, the room here will be the operators. So all visitors will come into this room mainly for safety reasons. If there is a leak of CO2 in the compressor room here, it will push out uh, the oxygen and potentially also freeze the room completely. So for safety reasons we are in the visiting room. The electrical energy for the district heating for the future plant is supplied through two 25 MVA transformers. The electrical energy arrives at 60 kilovolts in cables underground here, enters in the bottom of the transformers, which transform the electricity down to 10 kilovolts. Inside the, the building here behind us, we have a 10 kilovolt switch gear, and from the switch gear, we are sending 10 kilovolts out to all our main consumers and in each building we have a transformer there which transforms the electricity down to the different consumers typically 400 volt or 690 volt so very traditionally built behind the, uh, the transformer here we have harmonic filters most of the uh, motor drives on the side is with frequency converters which means that we generate harmonics in the grid so in order to fulfill our grid uh, code requirements we have harmonic filters on the 10 kilovolt side and actually also on the low voltage sides of the system furthermore a little bit further down in this building we have a emergency generator it is so that we only have one electrical supply to the site coming from a transformer station across the, uh, the road. We do not have an option here to have two independent feed-ins. For that reason we have put in an emergency generator if we should have a loss of uh, primary electrical power we have an emergency generator. It's of uh, two and a half megawatt whereas we can put 50 megawatt in with our main transformers, but two and a half megawatt is enough for us to operate our pumping station and operate our backup boilers. So in most cases when we have a blackout, it actually takes very short time to recover from the mistake. But should it persist for a longer period of time, we can start up our peak load plant here or emergency plant, which can supply us with 150 megawatts, which can keep us going for a very long time, even on a winter's day. So that's why we have sized it, but of course it will be expensive, but it's reliable and it gives the redundancy we need. The accumulator tank you can see behind me is 40 meters high. It provides the static pressure of the entire district heating network and also the production network here on site. The tank cons is, is about 40,000 cubic meters of water, corresponding to around 2,500 megawatt hours, which means that even on the coldest day, if the tank is full, we will have several hours of heat accumulated, which means that there will be no reason for, for panic, even if we should lose all our production, it will take several hours before the consumers uh, will actually notice any difference in the network. It also gives us the opportunity that we can decouple our production 
um, of heat from our consumption of heat. This gives us the opportunity to optimize our electrical driven units so that we can produce more heat when electricity is cheap. The size of this tank gives us a lot of opportunities to do that. There's plenty of room and it's actually been sized for the original coal-fired power plant you can see behind us which can supply 400 megawatt of heat uh, which is more than sufficient for the entire network. We are taking it over from Ørsted as a part of the, the new project here and uh, will integrate it in, I have integrated it into our system. We are here at the, the building new corner which is the heart of district heating for the future. This is where we are supplying the district heating to our customers. It's the pumping house where we have our distribution pumps. The district heating network in Esberg is actually four individual networks and we are pumping each of them individually. We can control the temperature and the pressure for each district heating network individually, allowing us to lower the outflow temperature and increase the flow individually, which actually allows us to lower the total losses in the network and thus operate our network at optimal conditions depending on consumption and weather and so on all the year. In the same building we have located our electrical boiler. Um, the electrical boiler is uh, 40 megawatts, uh, which compared to, you can say, which compared to the maximum uh, heat consumption here, which is about 400 megawatts, it's about 10%. The electrical boiler here uh, works primarily when the electricity prices are low. Then it will engage and uh, produce heat if the prices are sufficiently low. Um, otherwise, the boiler is a emergency and spare. So if we have a breakdown of equipment in our system, we can also use the electrical boiler, but at most times electricity will be a very expensive heat source, so we will only use it in cases where it's very cheap, or we will use it as a part of our regulating services that we are providing to the electrical grid.